What's going on, Bridging the Gap? It's your boy Roger, flying solo this evening. I'm gonna do this uh, this video and try to do a little bit of YouTube adulting, uh, technologically unsupervised uh, <laughs> content. My wife had, had wanted me to share with you guys, um, kind of elaborate a little bit on, when you hear me saying that they're teaching it in mass, if they're teaching the masses, it's, it's not the truth. Nine times out of 10, it's not the truth. Uh, the Bible tells us that wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many will find it. Uh, narrow is the gate and thin is the road that leads to salvation, and there are few who will find it. That's a biblical, that's a spiritual principle that, that applies to everything, and we're going to show you that a little bit, but what you believe is really where it all starts, and, and so they want to control, the elite have always wanted to control um, the information that you put in here. Because what you put in between here determines what you do, what your output looks like. So I want to share with you a document called the General Education Board and Friends. Let me pull this up. All right. So this document, and this is going to be hard. Um, maybe you guys can read along on the screen, but I'm going to read out of my presentation book because it's easier for me to see because um, it's a little small. This document is called the General Education Board and Friends. The reason it's called the General Education Board and Friends is because it's referring to our United States Board of Education, the U.S. Board of Education. Most people do not understand that John D. Rockefeller and Carnegie created our Board of edu Education and um, Congress allowed them to do this. This was back in 1903. They allowed them to create the Board of Education. 10 years later, in 1913, they had to come back and do a, a congressional investigation into what in the world did, did they allow these men to actually get away with. So here's, here's what Carnegie and Rockefeller and those 1% families back then understood. They understood that if they can control the entities that put out information, and if they can control the curriculum that those entities teach, then they can control the masses because they have this, right? So this is what they set out to do in the General Education Board and the Friends. I want you guys to see this, but to make it clear, in terms of curriculums that are taught, I want you to see the difference between the United States and the rest of the world. The majority of developed countries, if not all of them, learn the metric system as their primary source of mathematics, right? What do we learn here in the United States? We learn the Dewey Decimal System. Why do we learn Dewey when the rest of the world learns the metric system? There's one simple answer for that, and that is John D. Rockefeller was partnered with John Dewey and had endowed John Dewey to teach the Dewey Decimal System. That's what he wanted taught. That's what is still being taught to this day. He's controlling curriculums from the grade. So we're going to start on the right-hand side. There's four paragraphs at the bottom there that are highlighted. If you're going to try to read along, if you can see that clear enough. If not, I'm going to read it out loud so you can hear it. It says, in 1919, using Rockefeller money, John Dewey, by now a professor at Columbia Teachers College, an institution heavily endowed by Rockefeller, founded the Progressive Education Association. Through its existence, it spread the philosophy which undergirds welfare capitalism. This is the philosophy that the bulk of the population is biologically childlike, requiring lifelong care. Let me back up and say it again. In 1919, using Rockefeller money, John Dewey and some teachers at the Col Columbia Teachers College, um, who were heavily endowed by Rockefeller, they founded the PEA, the Progressive Education Association, and that association had one mission. It wanted to spread a philosophy, which that philosophy undergirds welfare capitalism. Here is the philosophy. That philosophy is that the bulk of the population is biologically childlike, requiring lifelong care. That's you and me. So here's what this organization that Rockefeller and the dude who's still teaching our kids to do a decimal system put together with these other teachers at Columbia Teachers College that they wanted this philosophy to be made broad, widespread, that basically, you know, we're, we're all childlike. We need lifelong care. That's how they viewed us. 
Okay, so why did they take over the education system to pull that off? It goes on to say, from the start, Dewey was joined by other Columbia professors who made it no secret that the objective of the PEA project was to use the educational system as a tool to accomplish political goals. So they had a philosophy we wanted to push. That philosophy is that you and I are ultimately childlike and we need to be taken care of. And they made it no secret they were using the educational system to accomplish political goals. They wanted to control something politically and use the education system to get there. And they had a philosophy that they were pushing in the process that says we're, we're not capable of taking care of ourselves. This is the mindset of the people who put together the Board of Education. So Rockefeller dropped out of high school. Carnegie dropped out of grade school. Between the two of them, they established over 60 different universities in this country because they understood what I said in the beginning. If they can control the entities that put out information, and if they can control the curriculum of those entities, then they can control the masses. So in terms of entities and universities, we hear HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, and we think that's us. You guys familiar with Spelman College? Spelman was John B. Rockefeller's wife's maiden name. Morehouse is another historically black college. That was his pastor and his business partner. We think these things are us. We always thought that because they say historically black colleges and universities, they were never us. They've never been us. And, and there's a reason for that. So now I'm going to go back to the beginning of this thing. On the left-hand side, in the first highlighted section, we're going to read, it says the rise of foundations to key positions in educational policy formation amounted to what Clarence Carrier called the development of a fourth branch of government, one that effectively represents the interest of American corporate wealth. So how did they pull this off? They pulled this off through a proper structure, through the entities they worked through. They, they pulled this off through a private family foundation. So they had these corporate foundations that were structured in a way to allow them to do this. So typically when I'm giving this presentation, I'm talking to people about proper structure. I'm talking to you just about the education system, but I need you to somewhat understand the structure that allowed them to do what they did, all right? So it says the rise of foundations to key positions in educational policy formation amounted to a Clarence Carrier called the development of a fourth branch of government. That in itself is pretty powerful. These foundations, had so much control that they basically were seen as a fourth branch of government. Goes on to say in the second paragraph, the corporate foundation is mainly a 20th century phenomenon, growing from 21 specimens of the breed in 1900 to approximately 50,000 by 1990. I'm not gonna get too deep into that, but I will say this. We have, uh, we're in 2019 and there's about 330, 350 million people in this country. There's less than 100,000 of these types of foundations in this country. It says, from the beginning, foundations aim squarely at educational policy formation. Rockefeller's General Education Board obtained an incorporating act from Congress in 1903. And this is what they did. So Congress gave them that incorporating act. We're gonna allow you to create this General Education Board and Friends. And it says, and that happened in 1903, and says immediately, they began to organize schooling in the South. Where were most of the black folks at? Where are the most of the HBCUs located? They're located in the South. And I'm gonna show you why they started there. Immediately began to organize schooling in the South, joining the older Slater cotton woolen manufacturing interest and Peabody banking interest in a coalition which Rockefeller picked up many of the bills. Now this is the critical part. It says, from the start, the General Education Board had a mission. A letter from John D. Rockefeller Sr. specified what his gifts were to be used, uh, uh, excuse me, that his gifts were to be used to promote a comprehensive system. You might well ask what interest the system was designed to promote, but you'd be asking the wrong question. Frederick Gates, the Baptist minister hired to disperse Rockefeller Largace gave a terse explanation when he said, the key word is system. American life was too unsystematic to suit corporate genius. Rockefeller's foundation was about systematizing us. 
So he used this foundation to establish an entity, the General Education Board and Friends, and told them specifically what he wanted his gifts for, to be used for, and it was to establish a system. And that system was a system built around a bunch of people who are biologically childlike and need lifelong care, right? It goes on to say in the second line um, from the top on the right-hand side, in 1913, the 62nd Congress created a commission to investigate the role of these new foundations of Carnegie, Rockefeller, and other corporate families. After a year of testimony, here's what Congress found. The domination of men in whose hands the final control, a large part of American industry rests, is not limited to their employees, but is being rapidly extended to control the education and social services of the nation. All right, the domination of men in whose hands the final control, a large part of American industry rests. We know that the game monopoly was created because of these cats. They were completely taken over entire industry. So they dominated those industries. They dominated the employees of those industries. But then they went on to say it's not limited to, to just those industries and the employees, but it is being rapidly extended to control the education and social services of the nation. Now, in 1903, they gave them the incorporating act to allow them to do this. 10 years later, it's saying these guys aren't just taking over industries, they're taking over education and social services, which means they are taking over our job. That's the job of the federal government. Education and social services is the job of the federal government. So what they're saying is not only do they dominate entire industries now and the employees of those industries, they are rapidly taking over our job. It goes on to say, foundation grants directly enhance the interest of the corporation sponsoring them, it found. Uh, and then it says the conclusion of this congressional commission is this, the giant foundation exercises enormous power through direct use of its funds free of any statutory entanglements. I'm gonna stop right there. So these giant foundations that Carnegie and Rockefeller and these other corporate families put together, according to Congress, 10 years later said they're, they're dominating industries and the employees, but they're now taking over our job and they're doing it free of any statutory entanglements. The IRS designs, defines a statute as any law passed by any legislative body, right? So you have your, 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 your state house of representatives and Senate and they pass laws, they're state laws, those are state statutes. Then you have the federal government with the house and the Senate and they pass laws and those are federal statutes. I want you to hear what this says. It says the giant foundation exercises enormous power through direct use of its funds, free of any statutory entanglements, any statutory entanglements. So they're rapidly taking over our job free of any laws that we pass, okay? And they were on a mission to create a system and that system had a philosophy that says that we are all biologically childlike, needing lifelong care. How did they design or how did they plan to, to create this system and implement this philosophy through the education system? Starting in the South which is where the slaves were, which is where the majority of black people were. It's a level of control that they wanted to continue to have. And now they're just controlling something different. If they can control you here, they still got access to your body. All right. John D. Rockefeller coined this phrase. He said, the ability to deal with people is as purchasable a commodity as sugar or coffee. And I will pay more for that ability than for any other under the sun. The ability to deal with people. How do you deal with people? Right here. If you can get to this, you can determine what they do with this. How they function, what their output looks like is determined by what they take in. Rockefeller is saying the ability to deal with these biologically childlike people is purchasable. I can purchase the entity. I can purchase the curriculum. I can inject that in and get the output that I'm seeking. Let me prove that to you. Endowments, and I don't have time to get into endowments and, and, and why they're so critical to the education process, but understand that this is wealthy people giving money to universities, right? It's called an endowment. I want you to see where John Rockefeller chose to give his money. 
says among medical schools which have received uh, an appropriation from the general education board are, and this is on the right hand side, Washington University. Now this was back in the early 1900s folks. This is not nickel and dime stuff. This is a lot of money. Washington University, 2.345 million. John Hopkins, more than 2.2 million. University of Chicago, 2 million. Joint fund with who? The Rockefeller Foundation. Vanderbilt, 4 million. Rochester, 5 million. Yale Medical School, 1.582. Mahari Medical College for Negroes, Nashville, Tennessee, 150,000. Let's go over to the left hand side. Rockef the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research, the Rockefeller Foundation, and who? The Laura Spellman Rockefeller Memorial in memory of his wife and the General Education Board gave money to these places. The University of Chicago was another large beneficiary. International Health Board of the Commission of Prevention of Tuberculosis in France, not the United States, in France. In 1914, the Rockefeller Foundation established the China Medical Board, so the U.S. Board of Education, and they're establishing the China Medical Board. In 1919, they opened the Peking Union Medical College together with pre-medical schools. In 1920, it established a division of medical uh, education which recommended large gifts for the development of medical centers in London and Canadian cities. It also made grants for the support of schools of hygiene at John Hopkins University of Baltimore and at the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil fellowships. I hope you get the gist of what I'm saying. I'm not gonna do a full presentation on this tonight, but I hope you can understand what I'm saying. From the beginning, the General Education Board itself, they understood that if they can control the education, they can control the biologically childlike people, Rockefeller told you, and we'll go back, the ability to deal with people is as purchasable a commodity as sugar or coffee. I will pay more for that ability than for any other under the sun. Where did he put his money? How is he purchasing the ability to deal with people? He's putting money into institutions that put out information. This is where you deal with people. So having said that, you have to determine which narrative you will follow. Folks, we can't continue to let people who don't look like us and don't like us to tell our story. I'm gonna give you some quick examples of, I say that if they're teaching it on any mass scale, then it's not the truth. So let's take a look at pharmaceuticals. We're told to go to doctors, doctors prescribe, prescribe medicines and medicines make us better. That's what they indoctrinate us with. Have you looked at just any of the commercials for these pharmaceutical medicines that's supposed to make you better and all of the side effects they create, they have to tell you what the side effects are. They will tell you, including cancer, heart attacks, strokes, up to, in, in, in rare occasions, death. But I need you to take this so this thing that might kill you, so we can try to cure or at least mask this thing that, that has no, no chance of taking your life. Who does that make sense to? Who does that make sense? Think about our food. Do you guys understand that the Bible told us that initially they were to live off every seed bearing plant, every seed bearing plant? Look at your grapes in the United States. When's the last time you saw a grape that had seeds in it? Look at your watermelon. Remember as kids, you used to spit out all the seeds. There are no seeds in the watermelon anymore. It's all genetically, genetically modified. It's not even real food. If you've ever seen uh, a McDonald's meal that is just set aside for days, for weeks, for years, it doesn't mold. How do you have French fries? It's a potato. It's grown out of the ground. Potatoes mold. You, I've seen <laughs> displays when these things have been sitting out for a year or two um, and they don't mold. They don't grow old. We don't even eat real food in America. Taxes. They've got us all duped into believing that, that you need to give up 20, 30, 40% of your money to the government. I'm gonna read you a couple of things. Uh, 
that the Supreme Court had to say about taxes. Supreme Court says in Ballard, in a U.S. Supreme Court, U.S. versus Ballard, income is not defined in the Internal Revenue Code. Income, income is not defined. What do we pay taxes on? We pay taxes on our income, but it's not defined in the code. And by the way, there's nothing in the code that says we have to pay income tax. Nowhere in the code can you find it. I'll give you a reward if you do. But everybody's paying taxes. The IRS code itself says this, it only provides authority for the secretary to assess the tax, not the income, I IRC code 26. They can assess the tax, not the income. How do you assess the tax on something you cannot define? You can't do it. The United States Supreme Court in Florida versus the United States says, the income tax system is based on voluntary compliance, not distraint. Voluntary compliance. Anybody ever tell you, tell you that you can volunteer to pay taxes, that you have to volunteer? And if you don't volunteer, then you're not, you don't have to pay them? Has anybody ever told you that? These are, these are just things that are ingrained in us because we're taught this. Why are we taught this? Because people like Rockefeller, Carnegie, Rothschilds, and all these other families understood that if they put a message out there strong enough, everybody's going to soak it up as truth, no matter how much of a lie it really is. So when we're talking about what's going on with the racial tensions in this country, around the world, there's a narrative, there's a story there that we've all soaked up. We talk about the continent of Africa and the images and beliefs that we have about the continent of Africa is based on the narrative of the people who don't want you to know the truth. So having said that, we're gonna, we're gonna finish up this video by, by just looking at some current things right now that are out in the media that, that, that don't line up with the narrative, right? These are, these are people saying things about the continent of Africa that, um, that don't line up with what you and I think about the continent. This is Jack. Jack is the founder of Twitter. I want you to read what Jack tweeted the other day, November 27th. He said, sad to be leaving the continent for now. Africa will define the future, especially the Bitcoin one. By that for a second, but he goes on to say, not sure where yet, but I'll be living here for three to six months, mid 2020. Grateful I was able to experience a small part. This is the dude who started Twitter saying he's moving to Africa for at least a quarter to half of next year, because this is going to be the future. How many of you know that about Africa? How many of you have heard that about Africa? Not too many. So rapper um, named Akon. Akon is from Senegal. Akon um, is actually uh, Senegal. He's actually in the process of building a whole city in Senegal. I believe it's 2,000 acres or something like that of land he has there. He's going to build a modern city in Senegal. But I want you to see what he says. Says buy land and invest in Ghana. This brother's from Senegal, telling everybody, African Americans, to buy land and invest in Ghana. How, who else is telling you that? Why would somebody from an African nation who's actually building a city in an African nation tell the rest of us in America that you're missing the boat if you're not buying land in, 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 in Ghana? African tourism industry is now the second fastest growing in the world. Read that again. And the date on this, September 29th, 2019. Africa's tourism industry is now the second fastest growing in the world. By next decade, if you are not in Ghana, you are not in Africa. Now this is a brother from Africa talking to Canadian investors. We don't know these things about our ancestry, where we come from. 
this brother's talking to Canadians and people like Jack from Twitter. They already know this is nothing new for them. They already know they're having conferences around this. Where do we put our money? It's the continent of Africa. Most people don't know this. We just talked about the tourism. Tourism being the second fastest growing in, in, in the world, right? Seven of the top 10 fastest growing economies on the planet are on the continent of Africa. If you're going to invest, you have to invest um, ahead of the curve. People didn't, didn't know, the ones who got in on Yahoo and Google and Facebook, when, when everything was said and done, didn't make the kind of profits that those who had the vision to be involved early. Everybody but us sees the value in the continent. And they're willing to put time, move to the continent, resources, Canadian investors looking for places to invest, and, and not just the continent, but in particular, folks are talking about Ghana, even for people who are from Africa and investing where they're from, they're telling us, if you're not in Ghana, you're not in Africa. If you do not invest in Ghana, you are not in Africa. Pay attention to what's being said because there's a reason it's being said. With that, I want to, I want to show you guys this shirt and I'm going to finish this up with another video, a short video from Akon. It's about six minutes long, but I want to show you guys this shirt because it's the absolute truth. This is the continent of Africa and these are the resources on the continent. And off here to the side, it says, Africa has never needed the world. The world has always needed Africa. That is 100% true. When we were in Africa um, for the Jamestown to Jamestown tour, I met with a brother who's from um, Credit Suisse in, in, in London. He worked for Credit Suisse, came on the Jamestown tour, and we were talking about the investment opportunities and so many different things to get involved in in Ghana, and he shared something with me that blew me away that I had no idea. He started talking to me about bonds, government bonds, like our treasury bonds. And he says, typically a, a, a U.S. treasury is oversold two to two and a half times. I, I said, what do you mean, Keith? I don't, I don't understand. He said, for every bond, there's typically two or two and a half people who want to buy that one bond. And, you know, there's only one bond, so one and a half people will, will, will miss out. He says, in Ghana, Bonds are typically oversold seven to nine times. Think about that. The interest in buying bonds in the United States of America, two to one, two and a half to one. The interest in buying Ghanaian bonds, seven to one to nine to one. There's a higher demand. Supply side economics tells you uh, demand deter determines the price. If there's not enough demand, the prices will go up. The yield on Ghanaian bonds are going to outperform American bonds because there's no interest in American in bonds. But we got a president calling you know African nation s whole countries. But that's the narrative, and we believe that because we still think people run around on zebras and elephants in Africa. So the things that they they intentionally put in here control how we function and what we, not just what we think, but what we actually do. Where do we put money? Where do we look to, to improve ourselves and our families? How do we do that? And are we doing it in a place where, there, where it's viable or are we doing it in a place where it's not viable? The reason that, that bond demand in the States is what it is, is because there's no way to pull out of a $23 trillion debt. There's no way that they can settle that up righteously. They're going to have to default on it. They're going to have to start taking people's 401ks, which is another place I want to talk about in terms of things that we've been told. 401ks is where the majority of Americans put their money to prepare for their future. I want to ask you a couple of simple questions. We'll start with what they tell us is good about a 401k is that you don't have to pay taxes on the money that you earn. And you can put it here and it'll grow tax deferred and pay the taxes later. A couple simple things. One, who can tell me what the tax rate's going to be in 20 or 30 years from now? Anybody got that crystal ball? Can you tell me exactly what the tax rates are going to be in 20 or 30 years when you do pay tax on that money? 
Nobody knows. You have no idea. Here's what we do know. There's $23 trillion worth of debt in this country right now. How are they going to deal with that without raising taxes? Here's something else we do know. When these government qualified plans, 401ks and IRAs and all that came about, it was only in the 1970s. You know what the highest tax rate was then? It was 70%. 70%. If rates just go back to where they were in the 70s, the highest tax rate means you give up more than twice what you give up now in taxes. So if you don't know what the rate is going to be down the road, but we are in one of the, the third lowest tax rate environment in U.S. history, you know what your rate is now and it's low, but you don't know what it's going to be down the road, but we have a $23 trillion debt. Are you planning for your future? Or are you gambling in your future? But this is what they tell us we need to do. This is what the masses do with their money preparing for their future. Got one last question for you about a 401k. Is the dollar gonna be stronger today or sometime in the future? That's a no brainer. If you're my age, you grew up in the 70s and 80s, you used to be able to get four candy, bar, candy bars with a dollar. Now it's like a buck 50 to get one. Your dollars are always gonna be stronger today because of inflation, because the dollar is dying, literally dying. So you're giving up strong dollars today for weaker dollars later at a tax rate you don't know. And this is what the masses are doing with their money. I don't care if it's a 401k, an IRA, a TSP, 457, 403b, all of those government qualified plans, they function the same way. And that's where the bulk of people are preparing for their retirement doesn't make any sense, but it's what we're taught. That's what goes in. So you're going to hear me talk a lot about lies that have been told. You hear Cheryl and I talk about lies that have been told, and you're going to hear me say over and over and over again, if they're teaching it in mass, it's nonsense. It's not the truth, and it's not to benefit you. It is not to benefit you. I don't care if it's your money, your taxes, your retirement, your food, your medications, or where you should invest your money. Whatever they're telling you, if they're telling you that in mass, it's not true, period. Anyway, with that, guys, we're going to wrap this one up, um, and we'll talk to you next time.